This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, a Charlotte police shooting captured on camera. We've all seen the video this week, so let's talk about what it shows and what it means for the cops and for the community. Also, new rules from City Council for Charlotte developers. If you want to build it taller, you'll have to make it more affordable. Neighbors in Steel Creek complaining about too much growth and too little planning. Haven't we heard this story before? In politics, who's raising the most money in the 9th District race for Congress and how are they spending all that cash? Plus, North Carolina also getting some unusual early attention from candidates running for president next year. Off the Record's next on PBS Show. Hi, I'm Jeff Sager. This is Off the Record, where we talk about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, or listen to the news, you'll recognize the names and faces around our table. Jim Morrill from the Charlotte Observer and Mark Becker from WSOC-TV. Thanks for being here. Also, Jonathan Lowe from Spectrum News Charlotte and Ashley Fahey from the Charlotte Business Journal. Thank you also for joining us. You can also join us in this conversation. Just email your questions and comments to off the record at WTBI.org. And welcome our Facebook Live audience. You can comment, you can like us, you can share our Facebook posts, you can send us selfies from spring break. Uh, we're just glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, kind of an interesting week, um, a week we anticipated when we talked about it last week, and that is the release of the video by the police department at court order. Uh, regarding that shooting a couple uh, last month uh, on Beatty's Ford Road. Um, lots to talk about, uh, lots of reaction. Um, uh, Mark? Uh, very, very, very difficult to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. to watch. And you at see the somebody time, die on camera. Very yeah. real. Basically, yes. And you see how it happened. The video, frankly, could not have been clearer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was. And, and I, I guess I will just jump in and say I was a little surprised when I saw it it looked like he was you know putting the gun down or trying to you know low lower his hands and at the same time we've talked about what could happen he apparently was talking to someone right there mm -hmm. point blank mm -hmm. literally uh, in the car and and that person could have been dead if things hadn't happened it's tough it's tough right and I was talking to a a prosecutor who said, look, it's sad but true. He's told families uh, that police don't have to be right. They just have to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. And if it was reasonable, and you can understand why he or she makes a decision, in the end, it may not have been the right decision, but it was a, a decision made reasonably at the moment. That's hard. I think, um, you know, a lot has happened already, and this just came out on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, the chief has been on a talk, let's talk tour is what he's calling it and it's been heated uh, between you know the community being able to ask him face-to-face -face questions about what they've seen in the video and then him responding and even people calling for him to resign right. the mayor to resign mm -hmm. so there's there's a lot that has developed this week with that video but I, I just want to go back really quickly one thing that uh, one thing that I did is went back and listened to the 911 calls. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and listen to the 911 calls, it helps you put a lot in the body cam video into context. It doesn't give you the whole picture, but it helps you put things into context. And those two 911 calls that came in, all of this happened very fast, mm -hmm. by the way, between like 9 o'clock in the morning and like 9.05, 9.06 between the 911 calls and then the, the shooting happening. But one call came from an employee who said that there was a man in the store trying to fight an employee that he got it, and you can hear her saying he's got a gun. Mm -hmm. The second call came from a person driving into, was about to go through the drive-through, see somebody in the parking lot, a black man, um, who she believes was about to pull out a weapon. So then you put that together, and, and, and you hear in the employee's call her say that the manager is on the way. Well, you later see in the body camera video, as they, after they shot him, they walk up and the guy identi identifies himself as the manager. So that's who was sitting in the front seat. And you just wonder, you've, we've heard, because so much has been said in social media, what was that conversation? 
Right. What was being said between that man sitting in the front seat, because he seemed rather calm, and, and Dan Clears Franklin, we've heard in the community some say that he was praying with him as trying to calm Dan Queers Franklin down, but then you have the officers that came in and immediately when they got out of the car, it was it was like level 10. Yeah. So one of the things that I was surprised in watching that video, and it was hard to watch, but yes. in, in the lead up to the actual shooting by the officer, there was so much else going on. I mean, there's a person, a third exactly. person that walked yeah. into the frame and, you know, police have their guns trained on this, this guy with the gun next to the car. Another person walks into the frame and then uh, it, I mean, it, some seconds go by yeah. before they actually tell the people to back up. Yeah. But then, and then like, there's a person in the car that, yeah. uh, if you if you weren't familiar with the whole situation, that was a surprise too. The police knew that person was there, but there was just a lot of moving parts in this thing. And I guess that's that's one of the things that the public doesn't understand sometimes. You know, uh, for better or for worse, that there's these aren't simple, right. you know, one on one type situations in it, a lot of it's, cases. It's it's never. I think not even could could fairly say. Rarely, I don't. It's never mm -hmm. clean and simple. Mm -hmm. right. It's it's never, uh, and I would say black and white. But I don't mean to put that other context in there. But it's never quite that clear right. cut, right? right. So, uh, moving forward, this is what we, the community, have asked for: is transparency. And so the police released this video, and at the same time, the chief says, "Don't look at just one facet here. There there are the 911 mm -hmm. calls. There's mm -hmm. other stuff that sort of sets the stage around it." But right. This is what the community is asking for, and at the same time, I think the community is now saying, we want more. We see this, we want more. Well, that's what's come out of um, these let's, this Let's Talk tours, the more clarity on CMPD's de-escalation training, um, and also the chief saying outright that his officers are held right now to a legal standard, but he thinks that they need to now be held to a moral and ethical standard. But to the point on the de-escalation technique, um, some in the community, and a man got up during one of the community meetings and asked and said, well, I've been over to the training center and I've gone through that de-escalation training and what I see in the video is not what you are hmm. training people out at, the, out at that academy, because as we know, the community can go to these classes. CMPD has been inviting people to, you know, from the public yeah. to go to these classes in addition to their officers, so. And I, I guess that's the problem, is that the training is so different than the real life situation. I mean, you know, you can, you can slow that video down and, and parse it, you know, right. frame by frame, but the officers out there didn't have the opportunity to slow anything down. Everything is going at, at a, you know, split second pace. And, and just like the training, I mean, you can you can do it and you can redo it and you can redo it, but when you're actually facing, you know, the real life situation, I don't doubt that there is some sort of, you know, retention of what you've been trained to do, but there's also, you know, human reaction. Well, we have learned and confirmed, and CMPD did confirm, the chief did, that those two officers that responded, Wendy Curl and the other officer, had not undergone any of the crisis, I believe, CIT, it's called, it's called CIT right. training. Mm -hmm. um, so would that have made a difference? Right. I don't know, but that's to your point there. You know, unfortunately, this is not the, the first situation no. like this that we've had. We've had three or four now, right? right. In the last few years where somebody's, uh, you know, events have transpired like this. And I think one thing the community's learned, the, the police chief and the mayor, I think there was a lot of attention paid this time to going to, to the community and right. talking and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trying to quiet things before they got out of hand, which, which is a, a good thing. Yeah, right. I, I think everybody should be commended, all sides of this, no matter where you fall, on the fact that it's been a, a civil yeah. discussion, it's been, it's been emotional, right. uh, obviously, um, but, but, but it's also mm -hmm. been emotional within the constraints of keeping the peace in, right. in the and community. I think, yeah. I think the family of Dan Queers Franklin uh, are to be, you know, commended, you know, because obviously they're going mm -hmm. through very, very difficult time and, and have mm -hmm. those questions too, and mm -hmm. good questions. But they, they have, from the beginning, not fanned the flames. Mm -hmm. They right. have said right. this is something, you know, we, we, we want to, 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 to look at, we want answers, but we don't want uh, yeah. Violence and and the, and the father or, so, or someone with the family I did hear earlier say you know to Mark's point that they want the this to play out mm -hmm. you know the officer get due process um, mm -hmm. the justice system play out it, it not 
let this play out in the court of public opinion. I think it's important that the chief, uh, Chief Putney, has <coughs> done his talking to her in churches. I mean, I think yeah. that also mm -hmm. kind of casts, uh, you know, a, a, a different feeling about, you know, how people react and all that. And the other thing that kind of fascinated me, did this really change anybody's mind about what, what, you know, before you saw the video, you probably had thoughts about what happened and whether it was appropriate. Seeing the video doesn't really change anybody's mind, does it? I mean, it just, I guess it either confirms what you already thought on either side, you know, that the cops were just well, doing their job or that the cops overstepped their authority. I mean, I don't think that the trans, I mean, I, I think the transparency is great. I'm not sure it's yeah, I think the trans the that valuable when it comes to, well, you know, persuading I'll, people. I'll just raise my hand and mm -hmm. say, uh, you, you know, the, the line uh, that, that the police department put out initially right off the bat pretty much was the officer perceived a deadly threat mm -hmm. and, and, mm. and, and fired. And when I saw the video, mm. it's hard on the face of it mm -hmm. to perceive the deadly threat, I think. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I, and I think it's so yeah, that to me yeah. that that was revealing. I, I guess right. that so and I, how graphic it, it yeah. was. I mean, where you started, it's hard to watch. I think what's and I yeah. think that that's been the reaction mm -hmm. from the community. I don't know that people were prepared for that because wow. as we as you yeah. said, uh, they initially said that the, he per, that that she perceived a threat and. Yeah. You know. Well, it, it, it raises the question of what's a deadly threat. Obviously, the police definition of a deadly threat Correct. and their training is different mm -hmm. than what we around this table or the community could perceives as a deadly threat. Maybe that's too many TV shows or you know, too many dramas about this sort of thing. I think the next potential tripwire on this whole thing is what the DA does mm -hmm. with the information. And I don't know how long it will take uh, for the DA to come out and... and uh, Either charge the officer or not to charge, but yeah. uh, you know that's going to be a pivotal. And time even here. if even if the DA does not charge her, you could still see yeah. the police chief maybe level some sort of consequences if, if she violated any internal policies. Right. So she could still be yeah. punished. And I said a minute ago, releasing the video didn't have value. I guess the value is that. For, you know, in 2016, one of the big reasons that there was tension in this community was because of this perception that they won't release the video. The video shows something yeah. that they're afraid to show us. Now, everybody knows. Well, and, yeah. and that diffuses a, a very large chunk of what potentially could be, you know, a problem issue. In the I think the CMPD and the city leaders who got out before the video was released, because mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they had presumably seen it. They mm -hmm. knew what, what, what was there and how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. And they got out and had a news conference first. And then releasing that video in and of itself, we've learned a lot since 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the police department has learned a lot about how to handle the social media aspect of this, how to get out in front of it, and, and how to deal with those concerns before they hit the flashpoint. Well, and the, so. the, the law, what we also didn't have in 2016 was the law in the process on how these videos yeah. are released. A court order. A court yeah. order. And, right. I, and, and I'm sure that many thought that that would be an impediment to, to the videos mm -hmm. and, and in these situations being released. But we've now seen that that process actually works yeah. to get transparency. You know, and we down yeah. to having journalists testify yeah. during mm -hmm. a hearing. Yeah. You know, and, and CMPD it's, didn't want to, and it was released. It's so. an uninterested third party that's making the decision on to release or not to release, which I guess ultimately is a good idea because mm -hmm. it kind of removes the emotion and says, are there legal reasons? Are there, are there, is it reasonable in the right. first place to go right. ahead and do this? So, yeah. Well, um, uh, I knew we'd take a lot of time to talk about this. We've got other subjects we want to tackle this week, too, but I think it was. A, a discussion worth <coughs> having and a discussion I'm sure that's been had over and over again at tables like this and kitchen tables and, and we'll large groups and small groups and yeah. I guess we'll be talking about it until we you know have a resolution on this particular case. Yeah. Um, City Council this week uh, also talking about uh, the future of development around transit stations and how that might help them solve another problem. Ashley, you were at the meeting. Um, what are they proposing and, and might this be the one of the answers to affordable housing? So this has been going on now for about 18 months. It's really the first step to d establishing a unified development ordinance, which has been going on for many years mm -hmm. and will be going on for many more years, unfortunately. But this is something that Taiwo, the planning director, identified as a priority because, as we know, there's no new affordable housing on transit corridors, despite right. the fact that transit is obviously an economic right. mobility option. It's something that was touted as being good for yeah. that. So um, in essence, they rewrote the whole 
ordinance. There are some things that have stayed, of course, but there's a lot of very new things. And one of the biggest um, and most important, I think, um, aspects of this is a height bonus menu. So if you want to build taller than the new maximum height permitted in a district, you have to either add affordable housing or certain sustainability features or do certain capital projects like road widening or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but the, the, the linchpin of this, which I think is very interesting, is if you don't do any of that, you can pay a fee of $4.25 per square foot that you add. It's a little bit of a math equation, yeah, but a lot essentially, of yeah, you could, you could end up spending or paying $3 million for the housing trust fund, which obviously is the bucket used for building affordable housing. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, yeah. again, they found something that the developers want, which is height. I mean, uh, you can take a look at uptown and, and, and also around, you know, these existing transit centers now, and no, that's something developers would like to do. And so, is this the carrot on the stick that uh, that maybe will budge them, you know, towards affordable housing? What, where they what haven't been I budged think what's going to happen, this is what I, I see happening. I think we're going to get more money in the housing trust fund because mm -hmm. I believe developers will opt to do the fee rather than add units. I was going to say that I could yeah. see them saying, ah, three Cost million. Doing business. Yeah. Yeah. I, this, you know, my project, my idea is going to gleam me a lot more in return. Huh, I'll yeah. put some money into I, it and feel good about it in return. The prediction, in, and they did an analysis on this, the prediction is that more developers will opt to pay the fee, which again is fine, but then will you guarantee having them on the transit corridor? Not necessarily, because the housing trust fund, as we know, covers the whole city. Right. I think uh, it's a genius idea, actually. Yeah, it's like I said, and it, it again, finding a way to, to spring either dollars or actual development for affordable housing. Uh, if, if height is the is the is the thing that makes it work, then why not? Well, and we know in South End, um, yeah. developers have been going through a negotiated process. And as Mitchell Silver said, you got to move from a deal making city to a place making city. So, <laughs> hey, hey um, I want to talk one more thing uh, on development. You were at a meeting of Steel Creek neighbors when Jim and I covered city council when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, it was Highway Creek, 51. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It was Highway 51. I mean, but this is, uh, you know, too much growth, too little planning, um, too much traffic. I mean, this is this has literally been going on in the city for at mm -hmm. least 40 years, and it will keep going. probably longer. What, yeah. What's so different about Steel Creek, or is there anything different about Steel Creek? I think Creek? there's a few things. So we know that there's not much land left to develop in Charlotte. We, there is land to develop, but not huge tracts of land. And Steel Creek still has a bunch of that. Still mm -hmm. has these, you know, 100-acre parcels where you can go and do a town center development, which would add tons of traffic, tons of new, new development. Um, and we all know that the infrastructure there is still, it's still a little behind. Um, there was a, a w road widening project that was supposed to start next year um, on Highway 160. That's been delayed for about five years because of a funding problem at the state. <laughs> Wait, but the developers the aren't delaying their, their, <laughs> no, their, their, uh, they're, their they're projects not. at all. No, it, and on yeah, Monday's, put a in there. At Monday's <laughs> uh, zoning <laughs> meeting, there was You're a... Excused. There was a four petitions, and they were all for Steel Creek. Hmm. And that's just to add tons of new housing, tons of new development. Um, so the city council have said this many times. We do not have a policy in place to evaluate traffic on a rezoning decision. It's like, yeah, just stop right there for a second. There's no policy to evaluate traffic on right. zoning decisions. Which, again, <laughs> that's crazy. it's, it's yeah. insane. And mm -hmm. Ed Driggs has many times said, and he represents South Charlotte, he's like, I'm telling you guys, we need to like come up with some kind of measure, yeah. some kind of metric to say this traffic impact is too great. We cannot possibly do yeah. it with the infrastructure we have in place currently. Having <laughs> just spent a quality day with my daughter in Atlanta, I can tell you <laughs> there are neighborhoods like that that have just been sort of grandfathered in, a whole lot different than what they're talking about there. But listen, growth has been the single issue here in 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 North in, in Charlotte since I've been here mm -hmm. the last few weeks, and and it will continue uh, to be. And so, you know, Steel Creek, welcome to the party. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it was just land that was over there and just sort of just there. Sitting there. Yeah, yeah. It was same song, different not, verse, right? That's yeah. pretty much what it is. I yeah. mean, and yeah. so it, they're, they're going, oh my goodness. The mayor has said though, we need to maybe in committee or something talk more about, can we possibly evaluate traffic impact when looking at land use? Because there's a lot of re legal ramifications if you say, yeah. well, we're gonna vote down this petition because it's gonna create yeah. too much traffic if there's no policy in place and that could lead to a lawsuit yeah so there's a lot of things to consider here but I, you know i think council is getting really tired of hearing it they're going to keep hearing it no matter what but because yeah. um, traffic's the big issue it here. really is and <laughs> and without having the state funding for these some of these projects who knows what's going to happen people glaze over when they hear about zoning except for old city council member or old city council <laughs> reporters that's your bet this is like and I think, <laughs> you know to that point i think people almost would get tired of seeing all the construction nowhere you know right. you, you, hear you that drive a lot anywhere too. 
through the city you see construction, but it's not to enhance the in, the infrastructure. It's right. just to add another more more condo building no, more, or more projects, or apartments. Exactly. So yeah. increase pressure on the infrastructure. Right. All of it. Yeah. Well, and that's I think that's the big sticking point. Mm -hmm. They're saying we want a moratorium, yeah. which is a word developers absolutely yeah. <laughs> cringe to hear, um, until we can figure out you know some kind of way right. to, to get the infrastructure to speed. Well, again, I don't think we'll, we've heard the last of either Steel Creek's problem or this problem in general, nope. but still amazing that the city doesn't have a, an existing rule already for that. Um, hey, politics in our, our last couple of minutes here. Um, lots to talk about this week in the 9th District race. Jim, you've reported on several stories, I guess. Uh, let's talk first about, I guess, the fundraising. Uh, how are the Republicans doing overall and against each other when it comes to raising money for this 10-person campaign? Well, overall, you clearly have somebody at the top, Dan Bishop, Senator Dan Bishop, has put in uh, $250,000 of his own money, and he's raised uh, six times more than anybody, any of his challengers. So he's clearly on top. And uh, uh, the other candidates uh, who are uh, running, and some of the ones who are more credible running, are saying they're, they don't need the money for TV, that they're doing grassroots campaigns. That's, That's what, what candidates always, always say. say when they can't raise money, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, think you, I think you do see the race kind of evolving into tiers. You know, clearly you have a mm. top tier mm -hmm. with uh, Dan Bishop and Matthew Ridenour and Stoney Rushing and uh, maybe Lee Brown, the realtor, because the realtor's pack has come in with about six or seven hundred thousand dollars or more of TV ads mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. on her behalf. So. She's kind of a wild card because people don't know her right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like Bishop has kind of made a point to kind of make himself the front runner, talking about TV yeah. ads right off the bat, mm -hmm. you know, with the best fundraising. I guess in a 10-person race, getting out front fast is probably valuable in terms of, you know, surviving and, and, and being the person at the end of the race. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's not really, it's a 10-person race. There are 10 names on the ballot, but there aren't 10 right. credible candidates, frankly. And, uh you know, so he's really competing against a couple other people, maybe two or three other people. And, uh, you know, so getting out early, putting your money in and, uh, you know, trying to get get support outside of Mecklenburg County and, and try to uh, guarantee that the vote in Mecklenburg County isn't split up too many ways, which mm -hmm. it would appear to be with Matthew Ridenour from here and um, Stoney Rushing has support here, too. So, you know, yeah, it's I mean, going to work out up for him. It, Matthew right now has gotten some pretty big endorsements, right? I mean, he's well. So is Bishop, and uh, well, it, it, it's okay. You're right. You're going to split the split the split the baby here and have have a, a fractious party. I, I think it's probably headed for a runoff either way. I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily assume that. I think 30 percent isn't that high a hurdle to get. Is it I, just 30? Yeah, yeah, and I think th somebody will get 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Um, Stony Rushing is a name you've mentioned several times. It's a na ma name maybe that a lot of folks watching right now haven't heard before. But if you live outside of Mecklenburg County, if you live in Union County, where a lot of these ninth district voters are, then you refer Stony to Rushing is Hall. someone you've got to deal with if you're a Mecklenburg Republican and you want to you want to win this election, I suppose, right? There are a lot of uh, Republicans in Union County. A lot of Republican mm -hmm. voters in, in Union County. In fact, more than in Mecklenburg and. Uh, hmm. You know, he's he's a county commissioner. He won at large, and he has ties to the rest of the district. And even though he doesn't have a lot of money, he's not well funded. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's got the the Mark Harris Mark Harris uh, former candidate endorsed him, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who supported Mark Harris. So and you have to take that. Into it account. may not matter having a lot of money if it turns out that this st strategy of not having TV ads but doing most of it on social media and radio that could end up. You know, this is going to be a test for social media, I think, in this campaign, t social media versus traditional media when it comes to getting your voters to the polls. I because right. isn't, didn't Matthew right now, he, he said he's not doing TV, correct? He, not, not at this point, now. Yeah, so he's, not. he's doing social media, I have, I've seen at least. And you have to wonder how effective TV is, you know, broadcast right. TV. And uh, when you're trying to get to a very narrow mm -hmm. group of voters... You know, your TV goes to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that being said, quickly, you mentioned it. Lee Brown, she's a realtor. She lives in Cabarrus County. She, if you listen to the radio, you've probably heard her realtor commercials. But the Realtors Association is going to spend at least a half million, maybe closer to a million, on TV ads just for her in this wow. market? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of uh, crazy. <laughs> you know, because, uh, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she, she apparently has some other money that she's putting into the race. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and, and I... I yeah. halfway paid attention to one of those commercials, and and just on at the beginning, it looks like Dan Bishop is staking himself out as the Trump 
the Trump guy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's, you know, vilifying some of the Democrats in Congress and so forth already, the Ilhan Omars and so forth. And and her spot was very sort of warm and fuzzy and, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm well, it wasn't her mm -hmm. spot, it was a realtor's spot. Her, her mailers talk about the crazy liberal progressive okay, okay. socialist. Well, they're saying, they're saying, they're saying, they're they're you can have your cake and eat it too, maybe. That's that kind of a campaign. But she's she's a wonderful person, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, a minute left. This is not ninth district race, but uh, Beto O'Rourke came to North Carolina visited Charlotte, visited UNC. We're used to seeing this in South Carolina with the early primary, but is North Carolina going to get extra attention from the Democrats this year because of its uh, its status as a swing state of sorts? Well, I think it'll get extra status uh, to a point because uh, our primary is on Super Tuesday, right. so just a few days after the South Carolina primary. So, And also, most candidates just will continue to come to North Carolina on their way to South Carolina <laughs> or on their way back yeah. because we have a good airport. Yeah. But uh, Beto O'Rourke... Uh, you know, he's looking for uh, millennial support. And, uh, you know, he went to CPCC here, and then he went to Greensboro, and then UNC. So yeah. Apparently all the millennials Kamala. are coming to North Carolina anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Kamala Harris is going to be at Winthrop, I believe. Mm. Yeah, we talked yeah. a moment ago about getting out front in the ninth district race. Getting out front is, again, not necessarily a bad thing in a large field race yeah. that the presidential candidates have for the Democrats. Absolutely. Jeff, could I just mention on, on ninth district, I don't know how much time we have, but on the Dan, I just want to say on the Democratic side, Dan McCready has like a, a one and a half million dollars. Yeah, I forgot to But just that. the other day, to, not like he's hurting for money, but returned 2000 to Representative Ilhan Omar because of... What she said. Um, some people that, saying she's made these anti-Semitic comments, and so, you know, people found out that he yeah. returned the donation. Yeah, once again, all all politics used to be local. Now it's all national. Right. Everything, really every is. local race has national tentacles in it. I yeah. suppose. Right. Hey, we're out of time, folks. Great discussion this uh, this week. Um, really appreciate y'all being here again. Thank you for being here, and don't forget, you can always add your comments by going to off the record at wtvi.org. We'll see you next time right here on Off the Record. of PBS Charlotte.